We're talking about pizza. Pizza pie. Are we going? Yeah. Oh, all right. Hey there, welcome back to Ancient Recipes. Today we're making another American classic and one of my absolute favorite foods. I know I say that a lot, but this one really is the pie in the sky. Okay, I know, that was bad. And no, I'm not talking about pie as an apple pie, though I really like that too. I'm talking about pizza pie. This one coming straight from 1800s Italy. Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. It's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? Pizza has a long history. In fact, there's evidence that flatbreads with toppings were a staple of a lot of ancient cultures. Aztec, Persia, Egypt, Rome, and the list is literally endless. We actually made one of those original versions. You should definitely check out that episode too. But the pizza we're making today is the version that inspired modern day pizza, and it is said to have originated in Naples, Italy in the 1800s. So what's the story? Back in the 1700s and early 1800s, Naples was a bustling city on the water, so dense with people that most of the homes were no more than just a small room. Though it was a big city, there were thousands of working class poor people who were looking for cheap and easy meals. So pizza, or flatbreads with toppings like tomatoes, cheese, oil, anchovies, garlic, and more, were sold on the street. The upper class thought it was disgusting, until King Umberto I and Queen Margarita visited Naples in 1889 to show solidarity as a political move after a war to unify the kingdom. Legend has it that Queen Margarita, totally bored with her fancy French cuisine, asked to try the famous Neapolitan pizza. So, pizza maker Rafael Esposito whipped up three different pizzas that were popular at the time. One was the Mas Nicola pizza, which was made with lard, basil, and hard cheese. The second was a marinara pizza made with tomato, garlic, small fish, and herbs. And the third was the pizza alla mozzarella, which he topped with tomato, mozzarella, and basil. Can you guess which one of the three was her favorite? Yep, the pizza alla mozzarella. She loved it so much, she ordered it again and again. So many times, in fact, that they named it after her. And well, the margarita pizza was born. All right, today we're gonna use the same techniques and ingredients he would have to make those three pizzas for the queen, along with a couple pizzas that even predate his. And we're gonna try them out with the same toppings he used, including hard cheese, tiny fish, and lard. So, let's do it. We got our flour, and I'm gonna make a little well. We're using a whole grain flour here. They would have sifted the flour, but back then the flour wasn't as like fine quality as you see now. Nowadays with Neapolitan pizza, it's almost always that very finely milled, very high gluten double O flour. So this pizza's gonna be a bit more dense and less airy than the modern Neapolitan pizza. So I'm scraping in a little bit of sourdough starter. So back then, they wouldn't have had an instant yeast, and instead what they would use is a little bit of lump of dough from leftover from the previous batch. So sourdough starter is gonna give us the same vibe. I'm gonna add a bit of olive oil, and I'm gonna start kneading this and add flour until I get a nice, smooth dough. Once again, we are activating finger whisk. So this well method, you wanna start in the middle, and gradually add your flour. When we were looking up these ancient pizza recipes, most of them were like, start with dough. <laughs> so we're starting with dough. The recipes back then weren't as precise as now, but this well method is actually great because you add your flour and water gradually, and it's easy to gauge the texture without going overboard. This first step where you just get your flour hydrated is what they mean when you read a recipe and it says shaggy dough. I don't know who decided that that was the best way to describe it, but basically you're getting everything wet. It's not gonna be smooth. You're just getting your hydration correct, and then you start kneading. You can see everything is moistened. We don't have a bunch of loose pockets of flour, so now I can really focus on kneading. Okay, I need a little bit of height so I can just get in there. So it's time to activate tall sola. Wow, what a difference a few inches make. Okay, I'm just gonna keep kneading. 
Now I know right now it looks really wet and I know the temptation is to add more flour, but like, don't, like, please don't. If you keep kneading, it will get so smooth and so supple. It's really incredible. I've written like a lot of bread recipes and it's very hard to get people to believe me and just be like, just keep kneading, it'll get there. You must believe, you will achieve. All right. I've been kneading for a while and I'm really tired, but I think we're finally there. The dough is really nice and smooth and taut and oh, look at that. Yes, it's still a little bit sticky. This is a moist dough, but it's not like, you know, sticking to things because we took the time to knead it and it's gotten really nicely hydrated. And now I'm gonna cover this up and we're gonna let this proof overnight and we're gonna come back and make pizza. Deactivate tall sola. Our dough has been resting overnight and now it's time to divide it. You can see we got some nice yeasty little burps, some bubbles. I'm gonna gently press this out to redistribute those burpy little gases. And now I'm gonna kind of roll it up into a log so it's easier for me to divide. We're gonna go for five portions. These aren't huge balls of dough. And now I'm gonna just gently roll these balls just to make sure that they rise properly for the second time. All right, while our dough rests and before I get into all of the toppings, I got to talk with Italian food historian and author Katie Parla, who helped clear up some misconceptions about pizza's history. Hi, Katie. Thanks for joining us all the way from Italy. Ciao. So I know that there is a lot of different like fake lore or about pizza, where it comes from, why it became so popular. What are some common ones you could let us know that we should clarify first? There are so many, it's hard to even categorize them. I mean, when you think about pizza today, you generally think of a round disc with a rim and <laughs> tomato and mozzarella on it. But for most of Italian history, pizza was a sweet cake. Um, and even as recently as the turn of the 20th century, it didn't resemble what we know today, especially in Naples, where there's now a codified recipe and people are always competing uh, over who has the hottest oven, who cooks the pizza the fastest. Some of the first recipes are like baking the pie at uh, low temperatures for 20 minutes with toppings that don't resemble anything you can find today. The process, the various techniques, and even the ingredients and toppings, really, really different. So uh, 120 years ago, let's say, if you were walking down the street in Naples, you'd be more likely to find a pizza that was topped with uh, a slick of lard and anchovies than the sort of classic margarita, which is, of course, the, the sort of tri-colored mozzarella, tomato, and basil topping. This kind of pizza really started to spread throughout the world in the 50s and 60s. What was happening in Italy during that time? There was so much migration happening in the post-war era, and Naples was virtually destroyed in the Second World War. And so you had uh, pizzerias leveled, people with pizza skills dispersed. And so Neapolitan pizza starts being produced in parts of Italy that previously had their own local flatbreads, but nothing that was quite uh, Neapolitan in nature. And you also have this moment in the post-war era in which people start to gain economic stability so they can afford to go out, not to a restaurant though, they can afford to go out to a pizzeria. And so it becomes a common food that I think like everywhere in the world is a food that is relatively affordable. Most people can have access to it. And so it becomes not just something that's associated with Neapolitan identity, but kind of Italian identity in general. Now that pizza is all over the globe, do do you feel like Italians have a little disdain for like how the modern pizza has changed or do they feel a lot of pride that their food's everywhere? It's both. I mean, there's, there's truly this tension when it comes to Italian cultural food identity. Uh, mm -hmm. Above all, food for Italians is deeply regional, but then when it's reproduced abroad, it's seen as emblematic of the entire country and is always adapted for its location and for its audience. So it's natural that it would depart from its origins and that can make people frightened 
sad, and sometimes angry. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some angry Italians in the comments for this video. I'm totally prepared. Bring it. Well, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Italy. I really appreciate it. And, you know, helping us get some real solid facts on pizza. It was such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, dough divided and now rested. You can see it got nice and fluff city again. Katie mentioned they would have cooked these pizza on a metal tray back then rather than on the deck of an oven. So we're gonna do that and see how it affects things. So when I said individual size, we're not kidding. These are gonna be little guys. So I'm gonna gently grab our dough and stretch each one to fit in this dish. Katie mentioned how pizza was eaten on the go back then. And all you would do is take this little guy, fold it up, and you're ready to go. But I guess nowadays, when you have a big floppy New York slice, you do fold it up and eat it. So we have still retained those ancient roots. All right, now that we're done shaping, we're gonna start putting some toppings on. I'm gonna start with a little bit of shaved raw garlic. I like to put the garlic on the bottom. I don't know what they would have done, but it just keeps it from burning. They probably did this, right? Whenever I order a pizza, regardless of the kind of pizza, I always get extra garlic, even if it didn't have garlic on it. Next, we're gonna add some lardo. Lardo is different from just rendered lard that you fry in. This has been cured, it's fat back. It's basically like if bacon was all fat. So I'm gonna put this on next. It's gonna protect our garlic. I'm gonna to top it with a little cacio cavallo. This is a hard, funky, salty cheese that comes from Southern Italy, and it can be made from sheep's or cow's milk. And I'm just gonna add some dollops. This is gonna really bring that saltiness to this pizza. Oh, it smells really good. It smells a little bit like pecorino and taleggio combined. So you got that like nuttiness and that funk. And now to finish it off, a little bit of fresh basil. Then we got pizza one. I think pizza assembly is the best. We're just having our own personal little pizza party. So back then they didn't do like a seasoned spaghetti sauce kind of vibe. This is just straight up crushed tomato, totally unseasoned. What's awesome when you have this style of tomato sauce is that you have this like fresh vibe in the areas that are a little bit chunky because this is hand crushed. And then the parts that are more thin it kind of caramelizes and turns into like a little tomato paste situation. So that looks great. Next, I'm gonna add some garlic. Once again, probably too much garlic for most folks, but just right for me. Luckily, my husband also likes a lot of garlic, so it's fine, nobody minds. Next up is the kind of unique ingredient, cecchinielli. These are little fried fishies. It's just been dusted in a little flour, quickly fried. They're whole, they're crispy, and I've never had a crispy anchovy on top of a pizza. I love anchovies on pizza, one of my favorite toppings, and I love fried fish, so I don't know how this isn't gonna be good. Pizza margarita. You all know this one, right? You know what's going on. So we got a little bit of our fresh crushed tomato sauce, just a thin layer. You don't wanna overload it with the toppings because you saw there's not that much dough on here. It's actually pretty thin. And if you put too many toppings on there, the whole thing's gonna just be soggy. Fresh mozzarella. The last touch is basil, but we're gonna put that on right out of the oven. So the heat from the pizza is gonna really wake up all that basil aroma. Now, pizza four. This is the one I'm most excited about. And I think it's the one Katie was really talking about too. So simple, just garlic, lardo, and salt. How can you go wrong? These other two pizzas were very common before tomatoes were integrated. This first one would have been called white pizza. Okay, that's enough garlic. Let's layer on the lardo. I like most kind of pizza. I alternate between wanting like a very Italian Neapolitan style that's like really thin and fluffy and charred versus like a New York. And uh, even within those styles, every single pizzeria makes it a little bit different. And that's what's really fun, to try a different pizza every time. Our fifth pizza. 
We're gonna return to our cacio cavallo. Nice, salty, funky. Just smelling this cheese, I'm like very pumped to eat this. And we're gonna go back to our cecinelli, cheese and fish. There are so many folks who say not to do it, but it's a good combo. I say do it. Wow, look at that. Pizza's ready for the oven. All right, okay, our pizzas are out of the oven. They're so teeny tiny compared to what I'm used to, but they still look really, really delicious. I'm glad I finally get to taste them. While they're nice and hot, the first thing I wanna do is finish up my margarita with some basil. The heat's gonna really help the aroma of the basil like get all in there. And the lardo transformed. I don't know what I was expecting, but look at how cute it is. It's just like all the fat puddled into the center and you got these little curly bits of like rendered bacon guanciale vibes. I love the way that the tips of the fish charred. I love how we got a little speckle of dark spots on our dough. Looks really good. Okay, I'm gonna start by going for the margarita and I wanna eat it the old fashioned way. Fold it in half and just dig in. First bite was all crust. That's the problem. I didn't get any type of topping, so I gotta go in for a second bite. It tastes like a margarita pizza with a sourdough crust. We have a lot of tang because of that sourdough starter we used to make the dough. It's really nutty and hearty because of that whole wheat flour, but it's a pizza. It's a margarita pizza, it's delicious. Now, let's get into cecinielli with tomato and garlic. For this one, I'm gonna cut it into wedges because going through that crust is tough. It's very cute. The tiniest slice of pizza. Oh. The fish is like a little bit dry because it was cooked two times because it was fried and then baked, but it's got a lot of texture because we have the bones in there. It's really crunchy. It's not fishy. It's like just very strongly savory. Here we've got lardo, garlic, and basil. And I love the way that the center is just pooling with lardo. You can see that even though this was in the oven for a while, the garlic is nice and softened and just barely golden because the fat protected it from burning. It's a delicious combination. It's crazy because it's so simple. It's just three toppings and it's so good. The lardo's so rich, it's so garlicky, so having that nuttier whole grain crust is really helping balance everything. Now I'm gonna dig into my cecinielli with cacio cavallo and basil. Fish and cheese, a combo I'm a big fan of. Mmm. The cheese is so salty and you get a double hit of funk from both the cheese and the fish. So it's like very flavorful, really savory, really delicious. And now finally, this one is lardo, cacio cavallo, and garlic. I thought I had a favorite in this one, but hard to pick. It's pizza. Really nice saltiness from the cheese. The garlic is really pungent, a little bit caramelized. The guanciale is like totally rendered. You got these little crispy bacon bits, but there's no, it's not bacon, so it's not smoky. It's not taking away from the cheese. This one's really good, really nice combo. And I feel like the pizzas with the lardo, they got a little bit better crispy bottom because the fat went to the bottom of the pizza and really helped it crisp up. But I think this one is the winner. I think this is a pizza combo that I'm gonna take home with me for sure. This was really fun. This pizza is not far from pizza you can still probably get at a Neapolitan pizzeria. So those Italians who are worried about pizza going too far from its origins when it grew in popularity can take some comfort knowing that the original legacy is still alive and still delicious. Well, I learned that Neapolitan pizza has kept pretty true to its origins, that my favorite of the originals has lardo and cacio cavallo, and fried anchovies aren't too bad. It's kind of amazing how food can instantly make you feel connected to past cultures and time periods. It's a little like a time machine of dough and sauce and sugar. And there aren't many other things like it. I will see you next time.
know the deal by now. If you liked the episode, make sure to like and subscribe and check out other episodes down below. And if you have a vintage or ancient recipe you want us to try out, drop it in the comments. I always love to see them.